was the first to make the crossing uh, to great sensation. And uh, she was captained by Edward Smith, the same man who led Titanic to her doom. But there's a connection between Royal Grandy and the Olympic. And it includes this soldier, a Wasna Valley boy, uh, William Reeves, who served in the 91st Infantry Division, sometimes referred to as the Wild West Division. Bunch of tough guys. Another uh, Wasna Valley boy, Albert Tarwater, also served in the 91st. And both young men fought during the decisive campaign between September and November of 1918, when the American presence really made itself felt. Uh, the Muser gun offensive, which would end the First World War. And both of them had shipped out to France on Titanic sister ship, Olympic. And there's Olympic in her peacetime paint. Tragically, both of them were killed. Uh, but again, they were killed during a, a series of battles that would bring an end to the First World War. But in that brief period of time, it's just uh, the intensity of the fighting is something that amazes me to lose 26,000 young Americans in uh, that number of weeks. Just staggering. This young man uh, actually uh, was above all that. You know, tragically, he died in an aircraft accident while preparing to go over to France. Uh, Moser's father built uh, the building on Branch Street that is today Posey's in the Village that was built in 1920, uh, two years after Mr. Moser had lost James. And once more, there seemed to be a connection between Harlan Wolf, the builders of Olympic and Titanic. James Moser's body came home on a Harlan Wolf steamship. The uh, the First World War, it was primarily American bodies that made the difference because American technology uh, was woefully deficient. Uh, the, uh, the rifle, the 1903 Springfield, was of American make. Not much else was. The helmets, there's a 91st Infantry Division helmet. It was basically a knockoff of the British helmet. The uh, light machine gun. The uh, soldiers carrying there, uh, we saw a glimpse of a Marine using it in that film clip from Bella Wood, was a chocot. That was a French gun. Our machine guns were British Maxim guns. Tanks, our tankers drove, were French Renault. And the airplanes, planes like uh, this one from Eddie Rickenbacker's Hat in a Ring Squadron, were obsolete French Newports. Characters like uh, the Red Baron must have licked their lips when they saw an American squadron flying into combat. So we were woefully unprepared. And so were our soldiers who were woefully undertrained. And early in the war, they were killed like these soldiers were, essentially in almost parade ground rows. It was tragic. But again, it was our numbers that made the difference. Uh, the French asked to borrow our black soldiers. We were using them as stevedores. And it, as it turns out, they fought like proverbial tigers. And a regiment that we mentioned in the Civil War, the Irish American 69th Regiment, also distinguished itself in the war. Uh, and its, uh, its chaplain has a prominent place in Times Square today. When the war came to an end, it was out of the proverbial frying pan into the fire. This is a, a float. Armistice Day in San Luis Obispo is being celebrated in, in the, uh, the weeks after the armistice had been signed. And even at Branch School, they celebrated the armistice. Uh, th these are the flags of the victorious allied nations that the little kids are demonstrating out in front of the school on the school steps. And here's an armistice parade in downtown San Luis Obispo, uh, doughboys, sailors. And in the background, you can see the old county courthouse built in 1874. That's the one that Alex McDonald would knock down with his bulldozer 
shortly before World War II. And uh, this is a photograph, July 4th, 1918. This is the 5th Marine Regiment, the same regiment that had fought at Bella Wood. So these are survivors and replacements. And somewhere in that phalanx of United States Marines is Judge Jerry Dana, who was a constable, a justice of the peace, and a municipal court judge for many, many years in a Royal Grand. He had offices, actually. His courtroom was in Grover Beach. Uh, he entered the 5th Marines uh, shortly after Bella Wood, but would fight until the end of the war. In fact, he would remain in the Marine Corps until 1923. And here he is with his wife, Dorothy. Uh, Dana had a, a reputation, as did his wife, Dorothy, who was a kindergarten teacher, for being an enormously kind man uh, who uh, was not above giving teenagers a, a Dutch uncle talk for careless driving, but usually gave them a second chance, too. Two more veterans, Ivan Loomis and his wife, Christine. Ivan was a student at Stanford. Stanford formed a, an ambulance corps that went over to France. And Ivan was part of that. He met Christine, uh, who uh, still fit into her nurse's uniform from the First World War. And Ivan is the son in E.C. Loomis's son. And both of them, just as uh, Judge Dana and Dorothy became important to Royal Grandy, so did Ivan and Christine. In fact, uh, they were uh, big uh, proponents, among other things, of campfire. And Camp Natoma was a uh, Ivan Loomis, Christine Brown Loomis uh, project. And here's the feed store, which is vacant today at the foot of Crown Hill. Well, at least eight San Luis Obispo County soldiers, uh, pardon me, at least eight South County soldiers uh, died during the First World War. But what's significant is the way they died. These three we know about. The soldiers whose names are in gold were all claimed by the flu. which first emerged uh, since it uh, emerged uh, in Kansas, it quite you know, appropriately became known as the Spanish flu. Uh, but it would, uh, as we'll see, begin in America and cross the Atlantic and then come back again with a vengeance. At one point uh, in uh, November, 200 people a day were dying in San Francisco. I remember an anecdote about a little boy who lived in San Francisco, came down with the flu, got better. And when his mother finally gave him permission to go outside and play, all of his friends were gone. But the pandemic also followed the movement of soldiers around the globe. The American Expeditionary Forces, which deployed out of Kansas to France, were likely carrying the flu with them in the spring of 1918 as the Allies rushed deployments to halt the German Ludendorff offensive. The first British cases occurred in mid-April as well, spreading out of ports and Scottish dockyards. Still, little attention was paid to what contemporary physicians describe as a, quote, three-day fever, end quote, that was circulating in Europe in late spring and early summer 1918. In this first phase of the pandemic, most patients recovered quickly. Their fevers broke after two days, and most were fit for work within a week. Only a minority of patients suffered complications such as pneumonia that led to fatalities. Moreover, by June 1918, the number of cases in Europe and North America began to steadily decline, leading to a belief that the flu pandemic was over. In late August, however, the flu reemerged suddenly across the globe with much greater lethality. This second phase of the pandemic began almost simultaneously in Brest on August 22nd, in Freetown on August 24th, <laughs> and in Boston on August 27th, all major military port cities. Over the course of the next four months, flu circled the globe, infecting approximately 500 million people. 
Hospitals were overwhelmed. Doctors and nurses disproportionately fell victim to the pandemic while treating an unprecedented number of patient cases. Pulmonary complications appeared more frequently, contributing to a mortality rate 25 times higher than a normal influenza outbreak. Fatalities peaked in November 1918. And the first fatality here was in Santa Maria in October. Uh, oil worker died of complications from the flu uh, on October 23rd. And suddenly, from the Santa Maria Times, on October 24th, uh, flu masks became popular in Santa Maria, California. Uh, they became mandated in San Luis Obispo County, California. In fact, you could be fined for up to $100 for failing to wear your flu mask in public. And both sheriff's deputies and town constables busied themselves by running around and breaking up uh, gathering the people. Uh, the flu was that contagious. And Dr. Paulding's brother, OP, who was the health director for Santa Barbara County, became the most unpopular man in Santa Barbara County when he ordered the saloons closed to prevent the spread of the flu. And then uh, where uh, there had been a reported case, that home was placed under quarantine, isolated from the rest of the community. Meanwhile, here in Arroyo Grande, the Paulding home became a hospital. Uh, as the newspaper article notes, there were 20 patients in the Paulding home. Uh, many of them uh, rural families from the upper Arroyo Grande Valley uh, that uh, the Paulings took care of until they could get better. And the flu, as I said, hit San Francisco, seemed to hit San Francisco particularly hard. And that included two local young people who were in the Bay Area at the time, uh, uh, Evelyn Dana and uh, Vernon Thurwell, who was waiting to get into the Army. Here he is on the basketball team. Rio Grande Union High School in 1918. Uh, he was gone by the end of the year. And again, the, the damnable thing about this strain of the flu is it overwhelmingly claimed young people, including Harold Niergaard. This is an enormously tragic story to me. Uh, Mr. Niergaard, uh, his father farmed in the Oak Park area. Uh, he learned of his son's death when his son's letters were returned to him from France with the notation, return to sender, died October 13th, 1918. Then the flu hit a Royal Grandy and one family in particular, very mindful of the, the poor Cundiff family, was the Foster family in a Royal Grandy. It was a terrible year for Gladys Foster Hobbs. She and her husband had gone to visit relatives in Kern County uh, when she went into labor and lost a little boy who was stillborn, who was buried in fellows. Then two of her husband's brothers died. Uh, one of them who desperately wanted to get in the army but was denied because of a heart condition died of the heart condition. Another one was on a hunting trip in the Kiyama Valley and a, a fellow hunter mistook him for a deer and killed him. And then Gladys got sick. She wouldn't make it. Her sister, Faye, uh, came to Gladys to take care of her. Faye wouldn't make it either. Uh, when they died, Gladys was only 26. Faye was only 34. So again, they fit the terrible pattern of the, the uh, flu epidemic of 1918. And it was uh, had an impact in, in far less devastating ways. Uh, the, the Tanner Hall which stood where City Hall stands today, I think it was moved out to Tar Springs, was uh, where people went to watch silent movies in 1918. It was closed down. Teenagers were heartbroken. 
the movies were their favorite uh, form of entertainment. Of course, schools closed as they did uh, here during uh, COVID. And then, by golly, there was a, a, a ray of hope. Public and high schools will open Monday, much to the relief of fond parents who have been seeing a little too much of their promising offspring. Could use some help with spelling promising. So schools reopened on December 1st. That didn't last long. They closed eight days later, and they wouldn't reopen again until the following year. And the flu, as, a, as the, the video clip indicated, seemed to come in waves. Uh, that was the case around the world. It was certainly the case uh, in California as well. This is a, a pretty revealing chart from the Los Angeles Times in 1919. And the correlation the, the chart makes, whenever there are large gatherings of people, Armistice Day, for example, when Americans came together to celebrate the end of the war, there was a spike in flu cases that followed quite closely. Thanksgiving, the same. Christmas, the same. New Year's, the same. So uh, the flu took advantage of large gatherings of people uh, to claim many of them. And then a final wave in 1919 would again hit Royal Grande in particular number of cases reporting in Oak Park. This is February of 1919, when it seemed that things were uh, safer because schools were starting to reopen. And there was a ter terrific outbreak. They were extending Highway 101 south to Napomo. And there was a, a camp there where the construction workers lived. And there was a big outbreak of the flu in 1919. And town doctor uh, Brown uh, set up a tent city, a tent hospital there to care for the construction workers. And this is his office. It's a beautiful carriage house. Uh, that is a doctor's office on traffic way today. They, they weren't necessarily all for total prohibition of alcohol. They were for moderation. Another thing that motivated the movement was, was uh, domestic violence. Uh, this is a, a record from the Old Bailey in London uh, at about the time uh, the uh, began to call for prohibition in the United States. And it, uh, this is a, a rather ghastly list of domestic murders, husbands or uh, common law husbands murdering their wives. And then in the First World War, it became uh, kind of patriotic to abstain. Uh, the, the booze made for grain that could obviously be used to uh, feed soldiers and the horses that pulled their cannon, etc. And then it didn't help that uh, brewers had names like Miller and Bush. Uh, it, it beer became associated with what Americans uh, called the Hun. And that's what that, uh, that a cartoon on the right is alluding to. I think we got mad at France once, if I remember right. And for a short time, we called French fries freedom fries. Uh, so I guess this uh, that attitude uh, kind of carried over in Americans' attitudes toward alcohol as well. Something else the 1920s revealed. There was a terrific uh, gap between uh, rural America, which tended to be anti-alcohol, and urban America, San Francisco, Chicago, New York City, of course. Probably the best example of that would have been that's uh, Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan as opposing counsel in the John Scopes trial. Scopes was uh, tried and convicted for teaching evolution. I think he was fined $25. And uh, the, uh, the trial uh, was a sensation, uh, produced a, a stage play and film Inherit the Wind as well. Now, on the other hand, if there was a representative of urban America, it was the Democratic candidate for president in 1924, the happy warrior, Al Smith. Well, for rural America, Al Smith was a problem. A problem because he was a Catholic. And this was an anti-Smith button that appeared in 1924. He was trounced by the uh, 
effervescent Calvin Coolidge. Coolidge, by the way, liked to take naps in his rocking chair on the White House porch. Curious crowds would gather and watch the president sleep, wondering whether he had actually died. He didn't. He was just taking a nap. But after all, his predecessor, Warren G. Harding, had died in office. Who knows? Maybe Coolidge might do the same. And when prohibition uh, became law, this is, uh, again, another uh, uh, picture from a different angle of the old county courthouse. Can you see the bars on the windows? That's the county jail on the ground floor. And these are uh, sheriff deputies and volunteers doing away with demon booze. It seems pretty labor intensive to me because they're breaking beer bottles one at a time and pouring the contents down into the gut. Which makes me think that the fish in San Luis Obispo Creek must have gotten inebriated. I'm not sure if that happened, but this is how prohibition began in our county. It was always difficult to enforce. This is one of my favorite articles about prohibition, and it concerns the sheriff's office. In the bullpen, where evidence is kept, <clears throat> uh, a hundred bottles of seized liquor was stored there, and the contents disappeared. Not the bottles, but the contents. So I always thought they should probably look for a suspect with a really long straw. And this became, our coast uh, became a favored place for bootleggers because it was so incredibly remote. That's Cave Landing, which we know as Pirate's Cove, on the left, and at Spooner's Cove in Montana de Oro State Park on the right. And these two places were notorious uh, for bootlegging. Uh, the Froom Ranch, where that humongous shopping center is located uh, as you go into San Luis Obispo on Los Osos Valley Road. Uh, Charlie Froom uh, grew up there and remembered occasionally there would be a big line of trucks with canvas covers uh, that would come parading down Los Osos Valley Road. They would hit the two-lane 101 highway, half would turn left toward San Francisco, half would turn right toward Los Angeles. Of course, those trucks were full of illicit booze. And it, it was a boon to Charlie and his brothers because Los Osos Valley Road wasn't paved then. And when uh, a truck got stuck in the mud, uh, the Froom boys would harness up a draft horse, pull it out, and get a nice reward from the bootleggers. The poor Coast Guard. These were the two cutters charged with patrolling the coast from Monterey to Los Angeles. Uh, the Vaughn was a World War I uh, surplus uh, sub chaser, the ship on, little ship on the left. The Tomorrow was the other cutter in the area. Not a cutter at all. It's a tugboat. It had a top speed of eight knots. And the Coast Guardsman who served on Tomorrow referred to her as the sea cow. Hard to catch bootleggers if, if, if uh, the best you can make is eight knots. And there were bootleggers who were local products. Alex's barbecue, incredible ribs. Alex Angelou was actually got his start in the Pomo, where he was kind of a, a small time bootlegger. Talked to uh, once to a wonderful man, Don Gullickson, uh, Don Haru Hayashi, John Loomis, and Gordon Bennett were in the same high school class together. How they stayed out of jail, I'm not sure. If you've ever read John and Gordon's book about growing up in Los Angeles, they were hellraisers. But when John, or when Don Gullickson, rather, was a little, little boy, he remembered his dad and his hunting buddies, which included the local pharmacist, uh, going down to the beach, taking him along, where they would load up a couple of cases of booze to take on their next deer hunting trip. And Don said, I don't remember much about that, but it was some guy named Alex who provided the booze. <laughs> and they took me along, I guess, because I was four. And I guess they figured the sheriff would never suspect a bunch of men on the beach with a four-year-old of doing something as bad as buying illicit booze. 
It worked, I guess. They were never arrested. Uh, the picture on the right, oh, to have bought real estate. That's Shell Beach uh, in the mid-1920s. And the ranch house you see in the foreground uh, is still around today. The man who owned it was another bootlegger, another local bootlegger. Uh, that's uh, O.T. Buck, the only photo we have of him. And he was reputed to be the supplier of alcohol to, of all places, Hearst Castle. Mr. Hearst did not approve of alcohol. However, Marion Davies did. His mistress and the hostess at uh, San Simeon, she's with Charlie Chaplin. I think that's Douglas Fairbanks Sr. on the far left. Uh, by the way, if you've seen the film Citizen Kane, Charles Foster Kane falls in love with a thoroughly talentless singer. Uh, Marion Davies uh, did not fit that stereotype. Uh, she was a gifted actress. I've seen her in silence as a comedian, and she was hilarious. Uh, but she liked her cocktails. You see a couple of folks holding glasses of beer. Now, had Hearst been able to enforce his anti-alcohol stance, I'll guarantee you the guy in this next photo would never have visited Hearst Castle. Winston Churchill started his day with eggs and brandy and continued that pattern throughout the day. So I'm sure he would not have tolerated William Randolph, that's William Randolph on the left, uh, and his disapproval of alcohol. So O.T. Buck took care of that for Hearst. He provided the booze that the guests at the castle imbibed. And O.T. Buck's later became Maddie's Restaurant, Dining Deluxe, Shell Beach, California, and, of course, today, it's McClintock's. Now, uh, I would not have believed this story necessarily until I read this, the Chicago Tribune's a reporter, an old-time reporter, uh, in an article published in the early 1960s, recalling Capone and bootlegging days. And he specifically mentioned uh, San Luis Obispo County as one of Al's favorite places to smuggle Canadian whiskey ashore. And according to tradition, this is a, a pool hall in Pismo Beach. And that guy in the Oval is supposed to be Al Capone, who in fact was on the West Coast for a brief time until the police chief, Jim Davis of Los Angeles, found out he was here, intercepted him and put him on the next train back to Chicago. But uh, this is a pool hall in Pismo Beach. And see where Capone's sitting? Okay, today that pool hall is the Cool Cat Cafe. You can see the windows are the same. Hmm. And just about where that, that tall drink of water the waiter is taking in order, I think that should be called the Al Capone Memorial Booth. Hmm. Nobody's taken me up on that yet. And we had homegrown bootleggers, too. Uh, Grover Beach and people who made their own booths. Huge still seized in Price Canyon. Uh, Zane's Pool in Oceano was a cover for another bootlegging operation. So both federal agents, sheriff deputies, and municipal police participated in these raids. Uh, and one of the uh, federal agents, Murray Hathaway, would later become a longtime sheriff of San Luis Obispo County. And then things got a little heated. Some of the junior and senior boys, this is the old high school, the 1916 high school atop Crown Hill, began showing up to class inebriated, which probably explains their algebra grades. Uh, but when the state superintendent of schools heard about this, he literally exploded. He was furious. The boys had obtained booze in Pismo Beach. So uh, about 25 revenue agents descended on several places in Pismo Beach, locked them up, and put the proprietors into jail. Then things got serious. Uh, poor Gus Fisher was a butcher who went out one morning uh, to Pismo. To, he liked to surf fish. He arrived there at the same time as some bootleggers did. 
and not wanting a witness, they murdered him. So it got very serious indeed here. However, <laughs> this is uh, uh, Sheriff Jess Lowry, uh, and maybe the, the crowning event of his career. I don't know whether he was ticked off or he just had a sixth sense, but he was tailing the truck that you see in the photograph south on 101 and pulled it over near Pismo Beach. It had a load of tuba fours. And Lowry began moving the tuba fours aside, and lo and behold, 205 gallon jerry cans of pure Canadian whiskey. What a bust. And uh, there were, were other busts like Jeff Lowry's up and down the San Luis Obispo County coast. Uh, one uh, near Guadalupe uh, included uh, the arrest of. Pico Canero. Pico Canero was the little brother of a, a far more famous bootlegger. And that's Tony. After Prohibition ended, Tony was a man who believed in diversification. So he turned to gambling. And he had a, a little fleet of gambling ships just past the three mile limit. Uh, this one's off uh, Santa Monica. And if you can see the motorboat uh, in the foreground, that's full of internal revenue agents about to descend on Tony's uh, gambling ship. They would turn a fire hose loose on them and send them away. But it was it was quite the place. Here's an advertisement for the SS Rex. Dine and dance, cuisine by Henri. Play the horses. Oh, and there's a roulette wheel. So uh, this, uh, this guy whose brother was arrested near Guadalupe was quite a celebrity. In fact, <laughs> there was a movie made uh, based on Tony Canero with a very un-Tony actor, Cary Grant, in the lead. And it was called Mr. Lucky, about uh, mm -hmm. a guy who runs a gambling ship just outside the three-mile limit off Santa Monica who has a proverbial heart of gold. Tony Canero would go on to open one of the first casinos in Las Vegas, and it mysteriously burned to the ground. Uh, some said it was faulty electrical wiring. Others said it was Lucky Luciano. Uh, and then Tony died. Some said it was a heart attack. Others said it was Lucky Luciano. Well, Prohibition will come to an end uh, with the election of Franklin Roosevelt in 1933, but the excitement wasn't over. This happened four years before. Dorothea Lang took hundreds of pictures in Nipomo and in the South County. This is just one of the pea pickers, uh, which was a cash crop for many, many years in Royal Grande and Nipomo. Now, in some ways, uh, it was less severe here than it was in New York City or in Detroit or in Toledo, where at one point the unemployment rate was 80%. We managed to kind of struggle by a uh, barter economy. Doctors learned to accept chickens and pay. And the local citizenry voluntarily, uh, some prominent local citizens, uh, established a lumber yard to guarantee at least part-time part jobs to those who needed the income. And also uh, the uh, migrant camps on the Mesa. This, of course, is, a, is another, another Dorothea Lang photo of Florence Thompson, the migrant mother, uh, in a labor camp on the Mesa. Uh, the people came to the aid of these people as well. Uh, uh, Frank Bennett uh, was the first mayor of Royal Grande, uh, and his, uh, his folks, Gordon Bennett's folks, rather, uh, Muriel Loomis Bennett, when she found out uh, during the terrible winter of 1937, really heavy rains, those migrant camps looked like swamps. When Muriel found out there were sick little kids in those migrant camps, she took truckloads of blankets and huge cauldrons of hot soup up to the kids that other people referred to as Okies. 
course, they weren't. There were some from Vermont. And then in another uh, example, uh, a Margaret nurse at one of the camps uh, went to see the principal of Burrell Grandy Union High School, Clarence Burrell, and she said, Mr. Burrell, do you know that bus pauses at the gate every day of the migrant camp, and then it keeps going? So I'll have you know those kids want to come to school, which I find surprising, but evidently that was the truth. Uh, Burrell, who, to his credit, heard the woman out and ordered that the bus stop and wait for those kids who were notified that they could finish the school year as students at a Rail Grande Union High School. And there is the very bus. Now, I don't want to minimize the impact of the Great Depression either. Now, this is uh, from the old Farm Bureau records. But the total value, 1929, nearly $13 million, San Luis Obispo agriculture. And then by 1933, it had halved. So there was, a, there was a collapse in farm prices, and it generated tremendous hardship among farmers in the Rio Grande Valley. And I think sometimes the best evidence for the impact of the Depression here can be found in the old advertisements, the old newspaper ads. Here are two that advertise their wares, uh, suits at depression prices. You see a lot of uh, articles, in, in one case, an uh, advertisement on the right uh, for businesses that are going out of business. Maybe the most poignant notices are the legal notices. Uh, these all uh, advertise auctions, farm auctions for foreclosures. Again, Dorothea Lang uh, was really, this is the, one of the most fertile places for her photography. Uh, but this photograph was taken in 1939 on the eve of the Second World War. So the depression may not have hit here as hard as it did in Toledo, but as was the case in most of California, it lingered for a while. Every once in a while, something wonderful would happen, like when the uh, Norwegian fitter Elge ran aground off Oceano. The Elge was carrying a massive load of lumber. So to try to, to get Elge off the sandbar, the captain began tossing lumber overboard which attracted pretty much everybody in the South County because this was free stuff that was floating ashore. Uh, uh, so they began uh, taking the lumber home with them. Uh, several of the buildings at the old San Luis Obispo County Airport were built with Elge lumber, as were uh, at least part of uh, the Briscoe Lumber Yard in Arroyo Grande today. Some of that is salvaged lumber from the Elge. And then, as if things weren't bad enough, uh, there was a biblical plague of grasshoppers that hit Aurel Grande in 1934, literally eating everything in their path. Uh, the Cal Poly students, volunteers, came out to light brush fires to try to deprive the hoppers of feed, kind of the way they do with fire breaks today. But that must have seemed almost overwhelming. And then things got even more serious. This is a, uh, you might recognize these hills as you go north towards San Luis Obispo. These hills are on your right as you pass Shell Beach. And from Shell Beach down to the county line, the cash crop again was peas. And of course, when farm prices collapsed, what farmers naturally did, what farmers tend to do anyway, they worked even harder, which meant that the soil in the South County, particularly in the canyons around Arroyo Grande, became depleted. And you can see the effect, the gullying effect uh, on this uh, mountainside in near Arroyo Grande in the 1930s. And in this road, in another photograph taken by Lang. In fact, the, uh, the head of the Soil uh, Conservation Service said the erosion of Arroyo Grande uh, 
was about as bad as he'd ever seen anywhere in the United States. So the response was the uh, New Deal Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, 250 young men from uh, Delaware, New Jersey, and New York City arrived in Rio Grande in 1934. And their job was to begin to reclaim and prevent further soil erosion. They had a headquarters, barracks buildings, uh, on the site of uh, today's Women's Club in Royal Grande. And here they are. Uh, they later became repurposed as a recreation camp, Monarch Butterfly Grove between Gover Beach and uh, Pismo Beach. And uh, critics of the CCC uh, complain that it, uh, it, its uh, members were 18 to 25 years old. And it, it said that this, this organization, critics said, smacks an awful lot of the military, which, not coincidentally, the head of the CCC was uh, George C. Marshall, would be the uh, chief of staff during World War II. And they were probably right. The young men were uh, learned uh, good old army-style calisthenics, close-order drill, all that good stuff before they went out into the field to do their work. And not just the Royal Grande area, but also uh, these uh, uh, restrooms and the brick walls surrounding them in Morro Bay State Park were the work of the CCC. This is La Parisima mission before. These are CCC kids. And this is the way the restored mission looks today. And the idea is that the kids were sent to places they weren't familiar with. So kids from Royal Grande wound up in Montana. And of course, the kids that came here were from New York City. And this is a, one of the more famous CCC pictures. Uh, and this was taken uh, near the Methodist Tabernacle on a hillside above Royal Grande. There are $27 a month, and they were expected to send half home to the folks. This is a check dam made out of bean straw. They also fought brush fires near the creek. This check dam is still on the Armandi Ranch between Arroyo Grande and San Luis Obispo. And this is a, a the, the town seemed to get along really well with the Civilian Conservation Corps kids. So this is a praiseworthy article uh, from the editor of the Arroyo Grande Herald Recorder in 1937. And the town, uh, threw them a Halloween party. And then they planned a Christmas party. And then the kids had a letter to the editor, that little blurb on the right, uh, printed to, to thank the people of Royal Grande for making them feel at home. Now, other projects, that, uh, there's the Harris Bridge off to the right, which is about where poor Sam Cundiff lost his life in 1911. But the road, uh, which was then called Music Road, today it's Lopez Drive, that was a product by an early New Deal program, the CWA. The, uh, the beautiful park, Routson Park, that's now beneath Lake Lopez, was a WPA uh, project. And here you see Filipino men at a barbecue, as usual, dressed to kill. Uh, the, they... Uh, they uh, Remember, they love to send photos of themselves home to the folks all dressed up so they would think they were doing okay. And the PWA specialized in larger projects like the uh, county courthouse. Here's the old county courthouse, the one we looked at a few minutes ago. And by golly, there's Alex Madonna, gonna knock it down. He's wearing a pith helmet for protection. <laughs> I'm not sure how much that would give him. But he, uh, he drove up the steps to knock out the second floor. And then the Madonna family, you see the brickwork there? They gathered up as many bricks as they could because those were all Louis bricks. And all Louis bricks were the best ones in San Luis Obispo County. There's the courthouse that replaced the one Alex knocked down. PWA also built what is today the Paulding Gym. Uh, $14,000 is what that gym cost, and it put a lot of men around here to work. 
another PWA project was uh, the Orchard School, which is today a Royal Grandy High School's math wing. There's the artist conception. It had a much more mission kind of look. I wish they'd kept the tiles that they originally had hoped to put on the roof. And uh, the WPA, which the government directly employed workers, uh, made its mark in the Royal Grandy as well. The stone wall, which was uh, recently refurbished by the Royal Grandy Men's Club, was a Works Progress Administration project, as was the, the wall around the Royal Grandy District Cemetery, both of those WPA projects. And you can still see stamps like this one on sidewalks on Mason Street in Arroyo Grande. That was the last uh, major New Deal project in Arroyo Grande because something else was about to happen. They were pulled off the work on the sidewalks on Mason Street to go to work at rapidly expanding Camp San Luis Obispo, which leads us to next time. 